Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here, the host of this show. If you are new to listening to this program, go check out our archives because there's lots of great episodes there with smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies and organizations ranging from, we just interviewed the uh, co-founder uh, at Quicken, CEO of Quicken, uh, Netflix, Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, but will help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And my guest here today, Stephen Short, he is a entrepreneur. He's a keynote speaker. He's a facilitator. He's got a new podcast coming out called the Killer Family Business Podcast, and he'll be interviewing family business owners. That's his expertise is working with family business owners, but his personal why is helping people to aspire to a better future, to envision it, empower them through training and education to achieve that better future for themselves through their career and personally. And he also has got a company called ETC Consult and a program called Career Fit that they've developed to help people as well. Also has a program called the Next Entrepreneur Academy, which is for young entrepreneurs. We'll talk about that as well. And he just finished out as president two years during COVID as president of Entrepreneurs Organization Chapter in Ireland. And of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and content marketing, you can go to our, we our website to learn more about it at rise25.com. Uh, all right, Stephen, uh, pleasure to have you here. And for those of you who haven't heard Stephen before, I also interviewed him on our sister podcast, Rising Entrepreneur Show, where we talked a little bit more. That was a, a series focused on Global Leadership Conference through Entrepreneurs Organization that uh, we both were at, and, and you were actually emceeing a big chunk of it uh, there as well. But let's start at the beginning of your story. You grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Your parents had started businesses. And uh, what was that like for you growing up um, in, in a family where you had parents that were running businesses and dealing with the uh, you know, ups and downs that you do naturally when you have a business? Um, well, well, first of all, thanks for having me back on. I'm delighted to be here. Um, yeah, so growing up in essentially in two family businesses, it was, I don't think it ever dawned on me as a child that my parents were entrepreneurial. I just presumed that everybody's parents have jobs and everybody works and everybody's parents are working until 10 o'clock at night and everybody's parents are making deals with people in the Middle East and in Latin America and in Russia and all these countries to, to bring in students because we had an English language school. Um, that, yeah, it was completely normal for uh, the boardroom table to be the kitchen table and we'd have conversations and we'd have dinner and then halfway through dinner, my parents would be talking about a, a client who needed to pay something or something that came up. And uh, so it, it never really struck me as odd until I used to, as a teenager, would be going to my friends' houses and the parents would be kind of relaxing in the evenings <laughs> or would be um, going to the pub or going out to play golf. And I was going, do, do, do they not like work? What are they doing? <laughs> um, and it, it, that's when I realized that people can also have normal jobs. Mm, yeah. So. Was it an option for you when you were growing up? Like, did you, did you ever make a conscious choice? Like I, I would go down this path or this path, or was it just kind of baked in? Like naturally you'd go work for yourself. How did that work? Um, well, I started my first entrepreneurial venture when I was about eight, eight years old, nine years old. Um, I drew comic books, so I drew uh, strip comic books. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we had the office at home, I had access to a photocopier. So I was able to photocopy the comics and I would sell them in school. Now I probably, I, I sold them for five cent each, like the comic books, but it probably cost about one euro 50 to photocopy. <laughs> Not counting I got your it time, free. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so thankfully my grasp of economics has improved since then, but I mean, I've always been doing stuff. I've always been trying to get out there, set up something, do something for myself. Um, and actually one of the very first EO conferences that I was at, 
uh, a speaker said that uh, he was very bad at managing people and he himself was unmanageable. So he became an entrepreneur and that really resonated with me. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried working for other people. It just hasn't worked. So um, I, I think it was always in my blood to, to try and, and do new things and build things and yeah. to, to be tinkering with stuff and not to always be going with the status quo. Now, many um, second generation entrepreneurs that I've interviewed on this show will say that when they were in high school, or when they were a kid, they saw their parents working so hard and they knew that they didn't want to go into the family business. And then in many cases, they do anyways. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound like that was the case for you. It doesn't sound like it scared you off at all. No, I, I always loved it. I mean, I, I, my birthday is in the summer and the summer was the busiest time for us in the language school business. So I mean, I, on my 13th birthday, I was helping people do uh, walking tours of Dublin with students. On my 16th birthday, I think I was running a, one of the camps on my 18th birthday. I actually, at my 18th birthday, I had students at my party. So, I mean, it was like, it was always ingrained uh, in me. But actually, that point, uh, it's something that I, I, I talk to a lot of people about when people say, oh, my kids aren't interested in joining the family business. And what I found is, if you as the entrepreneur, as the current generation, if you're coming home and at the dinner table, it's really the only place you can vent. And it's the only place that you, oh, that employee just did something stupid or, oh, these suppliers are driving me nuts. All your kids ever hear is the negative side about running a business. So, of course, they're going to be looking at you going, why on earth would I even think about going into that? It sounds horrendous. Mm -hmm. But all they're hearing is that one side of the business because it's the only place you can vent. What I found then is exactly as you said, they end up going into the family business because when they're 15, 16, they haven't got a summer job and the parents go, well, you're not lazing around the house doing nothing. You're coming to work for me. And that's when they actually discover parts of the business that they actually really enjoy. So if we as the current generation are able to spend a little bit more time actually sharing the positive sides of the business with our kids, it can actually help them to, to frame how they view the business and how they view entrepreneurship and taking over the business in a much more positive light because all they're hearing at the moment is this barrage of negativity. That's affirming because I've tried to with my kids to kind of explain like this summer we went for a month up to uh, the mountains and you know I, because I had flexibility working for myself I was able to work from a, a remote place now I wasn't stuck going into an office or anything like that so I just tried to kind of communicate that to my kids about, you know, because daddy works for himself, we're able to do this. We're able to go somewhere else and have a good time in another place and then come back. Um, so it sounds like there wasn't like a, a distinct moment when you joined the family business. What about like after college or after high school, you know, did you make a conscious decision to join the business? And, and if so, when you kind of like formally joined the business, what role did you step into? Because I know some second generation um, will sometimes step into and they'll, they'll go in, in multiple different positions in order to kind of learn the business. How, what was the process like for you? So, yeah, I mean, I, I would also I would recommend that uh, if you've got a next generation joining the business that you don't just bring them in at a high level unless they've done that somewhere else. Um, the worst thing you can do is say, oh, yeah, my son has a, an Instagram account, so he's now the <laughs> VP of marketing. Like, it's just not going to work. <laughs> right. Um, right. So I used to work summers. I used to work uh, Easter, Halloween, like all of the holidays. I used to work in the office in between both businesses. Uh, I remember getting caught with cigarettes in school when I was uh, 15 years old and I was ex I was suspended for a week and I went home and the thing is, I was actually smoking at home at that stage. Like, it, like, it, our we have, I have an exceptionally good relationship with my folks. Uh, we're always all open and honest with each other. And I was smoking, and they said, "Look, this is just smoke in the house. It's fine." My mother smoked, and I smoked. Um, so I went home, and I said, oh, "I've been suspended for a week. I got caught with cigarettes." She said, "Can I swear in your podcast?" She said, yeah, <laughs> idiot. Um, right. That's it. You can work here for a week. So that's the, like, that's the, the mentality of it. Look, there's right. all hands on deck. Get to work. Um, when I was in college, I studied marketing. I studied technology. I studied computers. And always, really at that stage, like when I was in my final years of school, it was always the view that I was going to join the family business, but join at a low level and work my way up. Um, 
uh, because I enjoyed the job. I enjoyed the, the business. I enjoyed the, what we did. I didn't know at the time, I hadn't spent the time on like my why of aspire and empower the things that fulfilled me were being fulfilled by that business. And one of the reasons that we sold is that it really wasn't doing that anymore. It was in a race to a bottom. The industry was in a race to the bottom. Um, but when I was in college, it was always right. I'm going to leave college and I'm going to go into the family business. But what was very important for me was I had no experience of the working world outside of the family business. So I went and I interned in New York for a couple of months. Uh, when I finished college, I got myself a job in a language school out there. Um, and learned a little bit of the ropes, a little bit of the industry, not from my folks, not from the intro, the, the business that I knew, because obviously nobody in Ireland was going to hire me. Nobody in the UK was going to hire me because they were, it was too close and they might feel that I was going to steal business or anything else. So I went to a very different market, but then I came back to the family business, um, have done a couple of short courses, um, in, in various things, finance management, marketing, and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I started off as the general marketing assistant, um, summer school manager, general driver. Um, I actually, I remember the day that my sister and I, when we moved into the new building, uh, we were outside polishing the letterbox and the doorknobs and everything else of the new building. So, I mean, so your uh, parents I've made sure that you were, you were doing your time basically within yeah. the business. Yeah. 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 Um, and my personality that sometimes I would rail against that because I wanted it to be now. Yeah. I was going to ask, I mean, there um, must've been times when it's like, geez, like, I don't want to, you know, naturally like anyone who's in a career, they're kind of driven. They want to get yeah. past that. And there are, I mean, even at the time I knew there were times when I was like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm like paying my dues. I'm, I'm learning the ropes, but I, I know this, I know this stuff now. So let me, let me step up and step up and stuff. And this is the thing about growing up in a family business that like you've got to earn the same. You've got to put in the time. You've got to show that you, you have what it takes, that you have the interest, that you have the desire, that you have the drive to do it. The same as anybody else would. But you do have the added advantage of that you have extra coaching. You have extra support that maybe not every employee is going to get because ultimately it's a family business and right. um, you're, you're being groomed at some point to take over. Right. Um, if if that same, was the case, but, I mean, was there a point, was there a point where they, your parents sat you down and said, all right, you've, you put in your time. We're convinced now that you could take over this business one day. And so let's talk about you taking over this business one day. Yeah. So <laughs> what used to happen more often than that, though, especially when I was a bit younger was, look, we're not just going to give you this business. I'd rather sell it and let the people and look after the people that are in the business then just give it to you to flit away. Um, and that was very much driven into me that you're not just going to be handed this business. You got to earn it. Yeah. Um, and then I took on more things. I took on more responsibility. I went and did more courses and kind of proved myself at different levels, which got frustrating at a time. But at the same time, it was also building me up to be the entrepreneur that I am. Um, then, uh, we had a conversation then. And so I bought both businesses. So I bought the shares from my folks. Um, yeah. So we had conversations about that. And I kind of drove that. I engaged with the, the legal teams, with the tax advisors and everything else. Now, look, I didn't, if we went out on the, on the open market, my folks probably could have gotten more money for the, for the company. So I got, a, I got a good deal, if I'm perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. But I showed them that I'm putting my skin in the game. I'm... I'm interested in it. I'm not just going to wait and have this handed to me. I'm going to make sure that I have uh, vested interests. And they were paid off over a number of years as opposed to a big lump sum. Because again, it wasn't for them to maximize their return. It was for them to, to make sure that I was uh, yeah. serious about this. So was there a co-ownership and co-management period with your parents yeah. where you were kind of both partial owners in whatever proportion and partial managers? So there was a time, managers. there was a time where it was 25%, 25%, 25%, 25% between myself, my father, my mother, and my sister. My sister's not involved in the business. Uh, and then over time, I bought out my parents. My yeah. sister is still technically uh, a, an owner of the business, and I have no interest in buying her out. I'm, she, she's not involved in the business, but um, she's involved, like she's on the board. She, she does bits and pieces in the background and is uh, supportive, and it's a family business. 
Got it. Um, there were times when, um, when it was a bit frustrating and I would have arguments and be like, we need to be doing these courses or we need to be investing in this technology. And it was a bit of a risk and my parents were a bit more risk averse. And I'm saying, well, like I own just as much of the business as you do. And then the two of them would go, well, no, not together. And so it, it there's added baggage that comes with that. But one of the great things about having these kind of discussions and arguments for want of a better expression of family business, you can actually have these arguments with the best interests of the other person, as opposed to just trying to win and just trying to get the ego. Um, but it also, I suppose, forced me to make more business uh, rationale behind all of the arguments. And we need to invest in this because X, Y, and Z and be able to kind of test out my theories a little bit more and, and be a bit more robust in the arguments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd say I won most of the conversations, um, some of them not so, so easily. Uh, but then the day I bought them out and I was the, the owner of the business, essentially, uh, I remember trying to tell my parents what to do that day as a joke. Um, yeah, it, Didn't go they laughed, well. but they, oh no, it went over really well. They laughed, but they laughed in a way of telling me, yeah, nice try, but no. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it didn't um, flip. You didn't like take over and then all of a sudden they're following your marching orders. No, no, not at all. Um, so, I mean, at the, at the, in my talk, I talk about the, the beginning of it and the reason that this is so important to me. Um, I nearly left. Um, while, even through this process, even while I had uh, already put some money in, it was just, it was proving to be impossible. Um, because we, I want, I was looking at the further down the line, they were risk averse that we were having different conversations and I nearly left the business. Uh, and that's when I started down this road of actually figuring out, okay, how I can't be the first person to have this problem. Like in the history of the world, in the history of family businesses, there's no way that I'm the first person who's arguing with his parents about the business. And were um, there resources that you turned to in that period of time? Were there books, were there coaches, were there programs? There were books, which were like a little bit academic, if I'm honest, uh, and I'm not an academic person. So I found some of them a bit dry, some of them a bit statistic-y. Um, I actually picked up the phone. I, I rang a few people. I, I got uh, reached out to some people in my network who were in family businesses, some that had left family businesses because they hadn't been able to get this, some who um, had kind of good relationships. But one of the things which is, I, I suppose, lucky and unique about us is that one of our businesses is about psychometrics and personality profiling. So we were able to actually discuss this on a personality level and, and really objectively see, well, you're seeing things like this. I'm seeing things like this. This is where the, the tension is lying. So if we can address these things of, okay, you're risk averse and a results leader, and I'm more of a kind of a social leader and more tolerant of risk because I have a longer view time on this. How do we get a middle ground on this? And how do we understand where the other person is coming from? So as we can find a path out of it. Um, so that was, that was very, very useful. And doing things like making sure that we actually had some separation in the family time, that when we were having meetings about the succession side of things, and when we were having discussions about what the next steps were for the business, it wasn't necessarily in either their offices or in my office, we were out somewhere neutral. It wasn't a power thing. We would also make sure that we actually went to the theater or to a rugby game or to something else. Actually, as family, and you not found that was a the, better time to talk about yeah. these things. Mm, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. um, um, and, and not to get the heckles up because one of the things that I found, and I kind of was guilty of it as well. I took their, before I was really looking at it from a personality point of view, I was taking their risk aversion almost personally, like, oh, they don't trust me. So actually they do, but they have a hell of a lot more to lose than I do right now. So yeah. having that self-awareness in myself and understanding where they were coming from uh, really gave me a lot more um, clarity over what the next step should be. And maybe my impatience was a big part of where this problem was coming from. And maybe I needed to just take a few more steps to get to where I wanted it because ultimately that's, it's where I wanted to get to, but I needed to bring people along as opposed to drag them along. It sounds like every family business could benefit from that kind of psychometric understanding and testing and analysis to understand the kind of what's driving 
um, their behaviors and the way they interact with one another. Now I have, um, I mean, we do a lot of personality profiling and we do a lot of assessments, but to this day, I have, <laughs> I have not been brave enough to do a personality profile on my wife. So <laughs> <laughs> worried about what you might find. <laughs> I wor- worried, worried that she might uh, not like what she sees in me. So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> got that's, it. The, got that's, it. The, that's the thing. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was really useful, really beneficial, but also part of this, the, the, the five P's that I, I have this thing called the five P's of successful succession. And um, what's the purpose is the very first one. The first P is purpose. Like what are we actually aiming to achieve? And it's really common and it should be really common that the current generation have a shorter definition of purpose, maybe five to 10, depending on where they are, maybe five to eight years out. Whereas the next generation should have a much further vision of where they're going. Mm. And we need to get those where they overlap. We need to get them to align. And that's the, that's the key in all this. I was thinking too far down the road um, and willing to take risks and, and ups and downs to get there when my folks were um, more process oriented and more process driven to, to get to that end goal. I'm interested, based on what you just said, I'm interested to hear what you would say to this. So for a long time, I've kind of thought like, I don't want my kids at all to go into our business for a variety of reasons. I, I felt like, okay, well, they should, you know, stand on their own. If they want to create a business, they can create a business. The way that you frame it is interesting because you're really saying they need to prove themselves first. That's fine. But what's your strongest argument for why the next generation should go into the family business? So here's a, here's a thought uh, experiment for you. Uh, and as a, a succession planning consultant or whatever, um, I would challenge people with actually no family member should join the family business. The family business should join the family member because we have... 20 to 40 years stewarding a family business. We've all seen in the last, even in the last two years, I mean, how businesses can pivot and need to pivot. And just because we were doing something 20 years ago, doesn't mean we need to be doing it in 20 years time. If you're able to see as your kids are growing up, like these, these are their strengths. These are their interests. There's some parts of the business where we can, they, they can align with the, what we do, but there's other parts that, yeah, maybe, maybe they don't. So, um, Let's say that your your business is, um, let's say it's it, it podcasting, social media, content creation, uh, this kind of thing. Um, you do a little bit of keynotes, I believe. I think. Do you? Me? Nah. No. Okay. <laughs> so let's say let's say the kids are growing up and they they like the content side of things, they like the podcast, and they like the interview side of things, but they actually are a little bit more, uh, let's say, extroverted and like the types of people who do keynotes, like me who wants the fame and attention. Yes. That's not currently what your business does, Mm -hmm. but it is very easy to start adding that as a, as a part of the business, which is something which is of interest to them. them. This is what Mm -hmm. I call an inside hustle. So we've all heard of side hustles where we go off and Mm -hmm. we do something to Mm -hmm. pay for the holidays or pay for the car, whatever. But if we can build something within our business where our next generation have the ability to use the resources of the business, understand the culture, understand the intricacies History. of the business, they build a side hustle, an inside hustle that can either be A, bolted onto the business if it becomes really successful, actually it can become a core part of the business and may become the core part of the business. If it doesn't work, okay, we can leave it, uh, die off, we've invested stuff and we do a full po- post-mortem. What do we actually learn from this? What worked, what didn't work, why didn't it gel with the culture? Could we learn something else? So when I had the language school, I, we did, there's two examples that I give people about this. We used to run summer camps. It's actually how I learned how to run a language school, how I learned to manage things because it was only for the summer. When we sold a business, that accounted for about 25% of our overall revenue, those two months of the year. So it, was, it became a really big core part, even though it was a small thing to, to start off with. Another one we tried was online learning. We were way ahead of the game in this. So we were running freemium classes. It didn't, it, we, we didn't, we didn't give ourselves enough runway. We got a bit burnt out and we, we dropped it after a couple of months. But what we learned about online learning, about digital learning really helped us to be at the forefront of digital classrooms, online classes, blended learning, and teaching other people how to use technology in the classroom. So we were able to take a lot of that in. So that was two kind of inside hustles, one which became really important one which we just learned from. 
Mm. So that's a way that we can get next generation. So your kids, for example, what are they interested in? What are their natural, what's their personality like? What are their aptitudes? What are their interests? What, what areas of the business do they like? What do they not like? And how can we um, look at shaping that business? And now for the next 10 years, altering the course, you at the helm, altering the course a little bit to actually match them on their trajectory. Thank you. That's a great answer. So um, speaking of that, altering the course of the trajectory of the business. So one of the decisions that you made was to ultimately sell off the English language school. To sell the third child. Yes. 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 What was that one like? I mean, how did you broach yeah, that, that was, one? Uh, how did the how did the parents feel about that? So that was, and that was where I spent most of my time. I mean, my, my 90, 80, 80%, 85% of my time was spent on that business, not on, on this current one. Um, it's where I did all my travel, my marketing, um, met all the, the people that I met, got to have the amazing experiences I had. Um, then with a lot of support from my forum and EO and people who, who helped me kind of put some stuff in place six years ago now, no, five years ago now, we moved to Madrid for, for a year. My wife is Spanish, so we... We always said when we had kids, we wanted to, to live in Madrid so they, uh, in Spain. So they understood both sides of the culture. Uh, and when I was there, I spent a lot of time when I wasn't in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of, of the school. I spent a lot of time figuring out my why. And that's where ultimately the Aspire and Empower came from um, and having that as my, my clarity. And it's really at that point when I realized that I'd done everything that I wanted to do in the language travel industry. Um, the only way to grow was to be less entrepreneurial. It was more a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of price. People weren't as as keen on quality as they once were because they wanted the cheapest course to be able because they didn't see a difference in a differentiator, even though we had spent a lot of time doing it. Um, so I felt that the only way to to really grow was to start uh, replicating what we did and become a chain or a franchise and and setting up new places all over the place. And I knew that that wasn't for me. That's not my personality. It's not the way that I operate. It's becoming more rigid, more process driven. And I'm not a process leader. I'm, as I said, I'm a, like a, a thought leader, a social leader and a people leader. So I'm more entrepreneurial. So we said, right. So I said, right, look, I'm, I've really done everything I can in this industry and everything I want to do. Um, and I had to make a, some really strong, good arguments about the future of the industry. Again, defending these uh, concepts that I had about the way that the industry was changing, where it was going, what that meant for us, what that meant for our team, what that meant for the business. Um, and it took a good six to nine months, really, to, to convince my folks that my projections were already come, starting to come true. We could see the fruits of what was going to happen. And then COVID accelerated, like everything I said was going to happen really started to happen. Um, and we said uh, we'd, we'd sell. It took us a long time to sell. Um, I would think, especially, you know, a business that depended on people traveling, coming in person, yeah. doing things in person. To, I mean, it, exactly. selling it during COVID. Must industry. Have there are a lot of players. Um, there are an awful lot of players uh, in the market, but it was just through. The, that's a whole different podcast about yeah. that process yeah. of of selling. Um, and for the team, it was the, it was the right move. Some people stayed, some people left. Um, it was, it ended up being a bit of a culture shift because it was going from a small family business to part of a bigger corporate entity. Some people thrive in it. Some people found it too difficult to, to be able to make that leap. Um, but the students were happy. Um, the staff who stayed are happy. Um, and I have a very good uh, working relationship with the people who bought the school. I still I'm in contact with them fairly regularly, still in contact with a lot of people from the industry and, and really enjoy and want to see the industry do well because um, I spent a lot of time in the industry. I got an immense amount from the industry and I have a, a lot of friends in the industry. Mm, yeah. So to talk a little bit about um, the how that shifted your focus then when you you said 85 percent of your time was spent on that business. Um, that's obviously freeing up a lot of your time. Um, and then how that kind of shifted your focus and focusing on ETC consult, uh, ETC consult. Um, so ETC, we are, we distribute a lot of books and tests for different publishers, uh, psychometrics, people who need to have specific qualifications. Um, we sell into schools, special needs places, um, hospitals, the health service, uh, psychologists, things like that. 
But we also do a lot of training in person. We do career guidance in person. We do interview skills training in person. We do, we don't do, we haven't done a lot of facilitation in person, but that was something that I wanted to bring to it. Uh, strategy consulting and uh, and now the the focus on the family businesses with the successful succession stuff. Um, but over COVID, so we had a program which was a, a pen and paper program, which was really innovative, but limited with pen and paper, uh, which helped students of all academic backgrounds be able to get um, an idea of their career path. So we would be able to show them what types of careers that they're best suited for. Then through COVID, because I mean, I, I, we sold the language school. In, my last day was the 6th of December, 2019. So pretty soon after coming into full time wow. in TTC, COVID decided that I needed to spend a lot more time at home. So, <laughs> um, so through COVID, we actually rebuilt the entire program from the ground up. So mm. now we have a program which is unlike anything else in the world where you can have a student uh, in your, anyone from kind of 15, 16 years of age up, um, can do a series of tests on your verbal skills, your numerical skills, and your abstract reasoning skills, along with a, a modern interest inventory. And we will collate and go through our, so we're 100% criterion reference instead of norm based. Uh, and we'll give you a report with 16 careers, very specific careers based on your unique mix of abilities and interests. And each of these careers you will enjoy doing and be good at with a description of that career and how to go about getting into that career. Mm. Um, so we've spent our, our, our most of our COVID building that. We're also productizing the one-to-one -one interview skills that we do. We're turning that into a video on demand service and, and doing a couple of other things like that and trying to, to really take what we've done in the past, which is the family business and what this business did, but using my interests, using my abilities and my skills that I've learned in the other industry and also through EO, through different things that I've been involved in and adapting that. So the business now and in, in two years time will look very different from the business that my parents ran for 20 years, but it's still the same business. It's still the same core ethos. It's still the same core products just delivered in a different way with a different focus and a, and a different uh, angle on it. Mm. Uh, and that's why I think it's really important to allow next gen entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurial, but with a head start. Mm, that's great. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I want to wrap up with my last question, which is my gratitude question. I'm personally a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially to those who've helped you along the way. There's been a lot of people that have helped you along the way. Obviously, your parents, you mentioned your wife. Uh, who would you acknowledge publicly? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, this, this, I know you, you asked this question. You don't really want the parents and the, the, the team and all that because it gets- I'll make an exception in your case. Because I've grown up in a family business, my parents actually have been mentors to me through the business. Uh, and I've learned an immense amount from them. Um, through EO, I've met, uh, met uh, a lot of people. Uh, Carl Funke was- and still is to this day, uh, my mentor, I, I still am able to ping him and, and lean on him for, for advice. Um, but the interviewed him guy, a few uh, weeks ago. Great guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carl is fantastic. Yeah. Love him. And he and Angie came to visit us when we were in Spain. They've been to visit us in Dublin. We, I've been over to see them in, in Munich It's brilliant. Um, but also the, so there's, I was lucky enough to be on the first, re, uh, regional leadership Academy. Uh, and there I met, uh, Michael Lutzen Cricken or Lutze as everybody knows him. Um, I met him once or twice before, but it, it's one of these things. And if you're in EO, you know how the, I mean, you know how these things happen. Like you're at an event and just whatever way somebody says something, it can really resonate. And we've been having a couple of days of, of really intense uh, leadership, very experiential stuff, uh, leadership training, leadership thought uh, exercises, and really developing our, our interests and our skills. Uh, and he turned to me just at a moment when I needed to hear it, I suppose. Uh, and Lutzer said, like, that I need, I can't remember exactly the phrasing, but it was, I le was left with a profound sense of, here's somebody who I really looked up to who thought that I needed to believe in myself more and actually stop doubting myself and, and go for it. And it had a massive impact on me. And I've met him a number of times since, even through, um, through COVID and all these other things. Um, just before COVID. And I, I thank him every time because it has mm. really made an impact. That little comment made a huge impact on my, my mindset um, in that time. That's great. Um, so Lutze. 
He's a great guy. Great fun. He's huge. He's enormous. He's so tall. (laughs) I'm just thinking of uh, uh, our writers writing up the show notes afterwards. We have no idea how to track this guy down. Lutz uh, Tall. We have have the Google. Yeah. So Lutz is is, it's L U with the umlaut. uh, T Z E is his nickname. Okay. Uh, Perfect. That that helps. (laughs) All right, Stephen. (laughs) Where can people go to learn more about you and all the various different projects and your upcoming podcast? Uh, everything will be on successfulsuccession.com. That's where we'll have. So there's a white paper we've just released. Um, we don't have, so the next Gentrepreneur Academy is in kind of private beta at the moment, but if you go to nextgentrepreneuracademy.com, it'll bring you to the right page on our website, uh, with a little bit of information about that. And uh, the podcast will be there as well. So successfulsuccession.com will have everything. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Stephen. Pleasure. Thanks a million for talking to me. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.